And we're live with Game Changers with me, Vicki Abelson. And my guest today is, I don't even know where to start, Russ Conkle. I am, I am in awe of you and um, so excited that you're here. Thank you. It's my pleasure, Vicki. We've talked about doing this for a long time. I'm, I'm glad we were able to put it on the books. I am too. I'm so happy um, that we are doing it at last. You know, and everything I believe happens when it's supposed to. So this is the exact right time to be doing this. And you're so busy. How, how is it with the immediate family back out in the world and doing gigs? Uh, it's pretty incredible. Uh, we just finished uh, three shows here in Southern California, the Coach House uh, show at the Libero Theater in Santa Barbara and at the Canyon Club in Aurora Hills and they were all sold out and uh, it was it's an amazing thing to look out and see a full house of people that came to see you and uh, and we're kind of flying pretty high right now we're heading to the east coast on Friday to start a six show run um, starting in Connecticut ending up in Philadelphia and we're just glad to be be able to be out and performing in front of an audience it's pretty spectacular. So, Russ, what was your, uh, okay, so when the lights went out, when COVID hit, you guys were about to, you were about to go fly then. You were about to, was it, was it Japan you were about to do? You were about to, you did Japan. <clears throat> we, we were about to go back to Japan, and uh, we, had, we had a bunch of dates booked, and the documentary that Danny Tedesco is doing uh, about us would have probably already been out. Right. But fortunately, and I have to really give kudos to our management and uh, everybody that works with us, Lisa Roy, who's our publicist. She's and fabulous. Fred Crochel and David Halfont, um, our management, they focused us on building our brand. And we concentrated on, uh, on working social media and just uh, doing videos. We put out a few EPs just to keep our name out there and keep the music going. Yep, you got them. Oh. And you got the album too. So, and yeah. we just released the album on August twenty, August twenty third, and that album was in the can for the last two years. So wow. So we had fin we had finished the album before before COVID, you know, shut down the whole music business. So, so we what used were you the time wisely? So, okay, so you you guys did, and you were you were very present and doing a lot of podcasts, doing a lot of videos, making music. You were very present, and that was very wise. Were you? What did you personally? Did you stay busy? What was it like for you? Uh, no, because there weren't any sessions. You know, I um, I traveled a little bit. Uh, my wife Shauna and I had some business to do um, in Manitoba. Her parents had just, both of her parents passed away in two years and we had to go up there and travel during COVID and drive with our dog and, and, uh, and, you know, do some things that needed to be done. So I traveled a little bit, but as far as outside work, there was just only the immediate family. There was nothing else really going on. How, how is that for you, Russ, after all these years of, uh, well, the section was kind of a band, but still backed up other people. How is it to have this band of your own, you guys having your own band now? What is, what is that like for you? It's, it's a joyous experience. I mean, it's kind of like we've waited our whole lives to do this. <laughs> You know, yeah. and it's uh, it's it's a funny situation we're in. We're kind of in the situation of a seventeen year old starter band, but we're all in our seventies. <laughs> it's like perfectly reversed, you know. But some things that we have to do are a little more difficult than they would have been, but uh, there's still a tremendous amount of joy in in doing it and playing together. So, how is it? I have to go in for hip replacement in a few weeks. I mean, you know, oh my God. How is it at this age to be, to hit the road again? I mean, you haven't really had to do it in earnest with the immediate family yet, but you're gonna soon. Um, is it harder now? Well, for me, you know, uh, up until COVID, uh, you know, I've, I've been touring and playing with Lyle Lovett for the last 16 years. So we would tour a lot every year. So right. I'm kind of, I'm, I'm seasoned in that. I, you know, I know how to do it and, it's not so difficult for me, but after two years of not doing it, yeah, you kind of got to get back up to speed again. You know, do but you I work out? Do you, do you stay fit? Do you work out? Do you eat healthy? Do you do, do you do stuff to prepare for this? 
Um, not to prepare for for touring specifically, but mm -hmm. but I, I I still surf and uh, wow. you know and I we I swim a lot, and uh, you know my wife and I eat is like very healthy home cooked food, so not not fanatical about anything. There's nothing off the table. So I love that. So. Speaking of your wife, uh, you've been married since 2014 to, to Shauna, is that correct? Uh, 2000, 2013. 13. Yeah. And I am, I, we were speaking about it a little bit before we went on, on the air, but it's so lovely to watch uh, how romantic you are and how in love you are. And to have this at this time of your life is so beautiful to behold. Um, how, did, how did you meet? Um, I was on tour with Lyle Lovett. And then we were playing in Vancouver, British Columbia. Mm -hmm. And Shauna actually came to the show as a guest of Leland's. Um, um, Leland and Shauna had kind of become friends on the phone, having to do with a lot of stuff. Shauna was married to Richie Hayward for years and, uh, and was part of his life during mm -hmm. his passing. And mm -hmm. so Leland and Shauna connected and she came as Leland's guest to the show. And I walked off of the, the crew tour bus with a drink in my hand and walked over to them and they were standing outside the venue talking. And Leland said, uh, this is Shauna. And I said, I, I know who she is. And I walked over to her and I gave her a hug. And I whispered into her ear, I said, you're gonna be okay, I've been there too. And, uh, and, she, and she looked at, she stood back and looked at me and the next thing she said, Leland, how can I get his information? You know, and we started we started talking on the phone uh, for the next three months. Uh, I wore out my phone would die, my house phone would die. <laughs> We'd be on the phone for so long, and we had, we really had a a real old fashioned courtship. You know, we oh. didn't spend any real time together for about three or four months, and then we I I finally flew up there and and we spent some time together, and it's been the most incredible journey ever since. I love this story. Yeah, I and, keep and, asking her if she needs new glasses because I have no <laughs> idea why she would want to be with me. She's so oh gee, cool. can't fit. She's beautiful. I uh, yes, she's a beautiful woman. I've only seen pictures of her, but she looks gorgeous. And you're a beautiful looking couple, and the love just radiates from the two of you. And you, how was it to to merge your two families? You with your three kids, Leah three, Leah with four. Yeah, three, three for me, and and Shauna has four. Yep, and there. I, Aaliyah. Oh my God, look what I, where I'm going. And and Shauna with four. So how do the kids merge well? Well, I feel fortunate because uh, I her her four children are just magnificent, and mm -hmm. I was able to spend a lot of time with them while. Uh, her two twins were in high school and her youngest, Sydney, I uh, kind of, you know, I've been around her the most. So, you know, she calls me Papa Russ. And, and so I just feel like my life has just been incredibly enhanced by by having them in it. And, it, you know, and kids keep you young, you know, they keep you going, you know, so it's uh, it's wonderful. It's, it's a good thing. So is the youngest still at home? Nope. They're nope. all out, they're all out on their own, you know. But, but we still have to stay in touch. You know, there's lots of things for us to do in their lives. Oh, gosh, yes. Zoom is a wonderful thing, isn't it? Zoom and FaceTime change the game as far as staying in contact with kids when they're not close. Do any of, of, do any of the kids live in L.A., in SoCal? Uh, not Shauna's. They all live on uh, Vancouver Island in mm -hmm. British Columbia. Nice yeah. place to be. No kidding. So how did you guys manage the pandemic? What, you, you and Shauna, what, how COVID crazy were you or not at all? Were... Well, like I said in the beginning, we had to do a lot of traveling uh, during the pandemic, driving to, back and forth to Manitoba to, uh, to just take care of the, the personal things that were going on up there. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's how we, we, we managed it, by staying busy, you know? Mm -hmm. And and we've uh, we found a way to be able to spend time apart, but still be very close. So, you know, it's beautiful. It's a balancing act. But when you're with the right person, it's very easy. Oh, I'm loving this. And so and so you're saying tonight's the last night you guys are going to be together before Shauna has to leave. And She's got, just for, you know, I'm going I'll be back up there for Christmas. I'll spend Christmas in British Columbia with her. So uh, but, you know, we'll be apart for about another month. But so. 
Oh, yes. Thank God for FaceTime. Do you guys do a lot of FaceTiming when you're apart? We, we do FaceTime and we talk all the time. So, it's, you know. A mature relationship can survive anything, I think. Right? When there's love. Yes, you're absolutely right. And so how does it feel? I remember right before the pandemic, you guys were going to do a cruise. And I was talking to Lee and he was telling me that Wadi was freaking out because COVID had already kind of started and Wadi was nervous about going on the cruise. I, I don't know how you guys have gotten Wadi to get on a plane and, and go do things now, but how is it, how is it, how is it traveling now on, a, on an airplane and stuff? Well, it's really hard to tell, Vicky, because things change on a daily basis. I mean, like right now, I'm reading some things that says that, you know, we might be on the verge of a fifth wave, even here in, ah! the, in, the, in the northern territories, you know, and uh, and it kind of keeps going up and down. We're just mm -hmm. we're just really vigilant about being safe when we're, you know, when we're out and about. Uh, I live in Orange County. I live in San Clemente, and mm -hmm. Orange County has had great numbers for a really long time. I mean, everybody, uh, you know, abided by the rules and got their vaccination, and so there's no there's no mask mandates down here now. I mean, you don't have to show ID to go into a restaurant. Right. The, the show that we did at the Coach House, there was no there was no protocol for COVID of any kind. But that could change at any moment. So you just have to kind of be aware of where you are and what's what your surroundings are and, you know, adapt to that. So did you stay? Did you guys stay healthy through the whole thing? You and Sean and your family? Absolutely. Yeah, we all we we knock on wood. We just got our boosters the day before yesterday. So we're we're as vaxxed as you can get. So <laughs> vaxxed to the max. I love it. Yes. So, so Russ, let's go back. Well, I was telling you also before we went on the air that I get really emotional when I even think about it. I mean, I, I look at a list, I made a list of like, of, of, of you can't see it, but of, of all the people that you've played with that I can even count. And you really have, I think it's fair to say that you played on almost every single album I played over and over and over again through the 70s, the 80s. And I mean, just, okay, so I wanna know how that started for you. Um, I know that you started out in Pittsburgh, is that correct? I was born in Pittsburgh, yep. I, I was lived, lived in Pennsylvania until I was nine and, and I moved out to Long Beach, California with my mom. And you were playing drums because of your older Sorry. brother is that how that's okay um uh, tell us how you uh, started playing uh my old my older brother uh, gilbert um had a band and so i kind of grew up with his band rehearsing in 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 the house mm -hmm. a little bit different configuration it was drums upright bass saxophone and accordion wow but um but what kind I of music were they playing kind of polka music and standards and stuff like that but um I was very aware of music and instruments, you know, growing up. So he sat me on his lap and put sticks in my hand and it kind of stuck. You know, I didn't really start playing on my own until I guess when I got into the fifth grade. All the way to the fifth grade, huh? Yeah, all the way. <laughs> and, uh, you know, joined the orchestra and, you know, in the in the school and. And then, you know, I came, um, like I said, growing up in, in Long Beach for the most part and being in bands, that was like 1964 to, you know, to the present, you know, so uh, that was a, an amazing time for music in California in the 60s. So I got to be in, in a band in Hollywood, California. I was in a band called Things to Come playing mm -hmm. at the Whiskey Go Go. Were you uh, playing there when you were underage? Yeah, well, I think it was 20. I think okay. it was probably 19 mm -hmm. or 20. Mm -hmm. But um, no one was counting then. Yeah, <laughs> no, no one checked IDs back then. And who were you? I remember reading the list. Who were you opening up for when you were at the Whiskey? Oh, we, we, we were the house band for about 19 weeks. <sighs> and it, it's a pretty amazing list. Someone printed it out for me. Uh, the Hollies, uh, Cream, um, the Electric Flag, uh, CTA, which is the Chicago Transit Authority before they became Chicago, mm -hmm. the Hourglass, which was uh, the Hourglass was the Allman Brothers, I think, before they became the Allman Brothers. Wow. And wow. Uh, 
and Buddy Miles Express, the Electric Flag, I, I think I already said the Hollies, uh, the Birds, Gene Clark, oh, yeah, yeah. you know, it's just, it was an amazing, you know what, Vicki, though, I think I know where you're going with this question. I'm going to Jimmy. I don't know if you know that, but I'm going to how did you meet Jimmy and become friends with Jimmy? I want to know that, but go where you're going first. Well, it's just that my career has, if you look back on it or you look into it like you have and you make a list, you kind of go, oh my God. Oh this, my this, God. It's pretty incredible. But for me, when you're, when you're, you know, a 20 year old and you're living it, you know, I was concentrating mostly on not trying to get, I'm trying not to get fired or, or being <laughs> asked back to, you know, to, to have a gig. I knew I had to make a living. And so uh, I was concentrating on things like that. But I think it probably happened to me when I was about 45 years old, when I kind of looked back on it all and went, wow, I was, I was, in the, I was in the right place at the right time, kind of over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. But the linchpin to the whole thing mm -hmm. really, really was, was two things. My mom was incredibly supportive of, of me and my musical career, and she helped me. She just let me do what I needed to do, and it was wow. just the two of us. And then the next person that, was, that made all the difference in the world was Peter Asher. Yeah. You know, going going to being hired by Peter to play on Sweet Baby James was the beginning of, of a domino effect that was the same for me, for Danny Korchmar, for Elise Klar. And, you know, I without Peter Asher, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you. So, you know, well, you might be you, you with maybe a different career. I, I still think you would have had a career. What, what was the... I would have worked for the post office. <laughs> I don't think so, Russ. What what was the dream when you were the eleven year old kid playing eight, eleven, playing, starting to play? Did you have a was the dream right away? I want to be a professional drummer. I mean, what was the dream? Well, two two things happened simultaneously. My mom uh, sat me down the uh, summer of eleventh grade, mm -hmm. and she said, "You know, you're gonna need to get a job this summer." And I was in a band at the time, and I said, okay, well, I'll just, you know, I'll work it out. So I got a job at a signal gas station. <laughs> I read of, that. So what, what were, you, were you pumping? You were pumping gas? Pumping gas, yeah. I wasn't a mechanic, so I didn't, I didn't change oil or do anything. But I was pumping gas and cleaning windows and cleaning the toilet and all that kind of stuff. And after, you know, a summer of coming home with my hands so dirty that I could hardly <laughs> ever get them clean, <laughs> I, I said to myself, "This is this is not the road little RK is going to go down." And and then that and then and then it was the Beatles. You know, listening to the Beatles music just made me feel like, you know, if this can be done, if music and and a band can achieve this, that's what I want to do. You know, so because it they listening to their music just it was it was like a sign. It's possible. And so I kind of took that on as my own mantra that it's possible. And I wanted, I wanted to do music where it was going to take me. I had no idea. So did you gravitate listening to singer songwriters? I, it's, it's where you have played most of your career, but was that music that appealed to you as a listener as well? Um, there wasn't as much of it before you got into it. Well, I had the great fortune to get to work with a singer songwriter who I believe was the very first Americana artist, and his name is John Stewart from the Kingston Trio. He replaced mm -hmm. Dave Gard in the Kingston Trio, wrote songs like Daydream Believer for the Monkey. Oh. And I, and I, I got to uh, work with him, um, um, an album he put out called California Bloodlines. I, I was hired by him to do a promotional tour for Capitol Records to promote that album. And so I got exposed that's how I really got exposed to up close and personal to a singer songwriter because John was a phenomenal performer. What years was that that you were with John? Uh, 68, 69, you know, early 1970s, right before. And then Peter Asher came to okay, see. Okay, that's a what rehearsal. I was going to ask. When did Peter? He came to see a rehearsal uh, when I was playing with John Stewart and hired me to play on Sweet Baby James from that rehearsal. But but John, I was very, John, I, I I was exposed to a person who could who could write these really personal songs mm -hmm. and be funny. And and John was a very good. He knew how to work a crowd. He told great stories, 
And so uh, that kind of, and I had to play a certain way with him because those were the kind of songs that they were. So when it came time to play with James Taylor on Sweet Baby James, I had already kind of had, went to school on how to play on these kind of songs a little bit. And the same thing with Carol and playing on tapestry. So I owe a, a lot of, of my early ability to have simpatico with singer-songwriters to John Stewart. You mentioned two albums that I, I assume that everybody of our generation played the shit out of. I mean, I, there were no grooves left in either Tapestry or Sweet Baby James. And I, it is unbelievable to me that you, not only on, I, I was watching, um, there are some videos of you playing along to iconic songs that you've played on Running on Empty and, and, and some James Taylor tunes. And, and uh, it was so fun to watch you play along to that music. And I heard you say something on an interview recently that it's all about listening and uh, leaving, leaving space. And everything that you said about your approach to playing drums was really good advice for living life, I think. Oh, wow. Well. Um, I never, could I never you... thought about it, but thank you. <laughs> I think it's really true. So could you tell for those aspiring drummers out there or those who are playing out there, what is your take on, on when you step into a session, when you're going to play? You're going to say it better than I did. Uh, well, I, I just try to, I listen to the muse first. I wait for something to come in, you know, to inspire me to do something or which which approach I'm going to take on the song. Usually a song is kind of a... Uh, songs are similar in a lot of ways and you can and you can just go, okay, well that song's like this song, so I'll kind of play the same thing that was on mm. that song. I try not to do that. And I also try not to play anything that I've already played before. I try to come up with something different, you know, playing it, play it, play it a different way. Mm -hmm. um, one of my favorite drummers is Manu Cachet and 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 Manu plays in a way that I call he plays the he plays the negative of a positive picture. In other words, if you look at a, a at a black and white photograph mm -hmm. and then right next to it you put the negative of that photograph, uh -huh. that's what Manu does. He doesn't play on two and four. He'll play on one and three, but make it feel like two and four. Wow. You know, so I that really inspired me to. Well, there's lots there's lots of different ways to play a groove. You know, you can play on top of it, you can play inside of it, you can play behind it, but you also can can not play what's normal. Play something that's a little bit abnormal. If you so, I try to do that. I don't think I, I don't think I'm, I come up to come up anywhere near to the degree of what Manu is able to do creatively. Ooh. But but I but I love that approach, and so I think about that first. And then I just try not to get in the way. You know, it's kind of like what, what's the uh, physician's creed? First, do no harm. You know, that I kind of approach it that way. You know, if it's a, and I want to know what the lyrics are. I want to know what the song's about, so that it can, you know, so that I can play something that works with that song, as opposed to trying to play something that is fun for me to play. You know, I I would prefer to play something that's a little more difficult for me to play because it's challenging and makes you think a little bit more. So, I love that. So, so Peter Asher comes along, Sweet Baby James. I assume you had no idea when you guys were making that album what was going to happen. How could you know? You, could, you couldn't possibly know what was going to happen. No I assume way. you knew that he was amazing. Uh, special. Never special. heard anything like it. Yeah. So you lived through that whole time with James of, uh, I, we were talking before about how you managed to get through the life you've gotten through without being a stoned out alcoholic junkie. Um, you lived through all of that. I'm not saying I'm not any of those things. <laughs> how, how did you manage to get through all Did you ever have trouble in your life with that stuff, with substances? Um, I think I've done everything that everyone else has done, you know, there and, you go. But, but I have to say, I think what, what, helped me was that my my job as a drummer is is pretty technical and i i had to count songs off i had to you know i had to you know be able to walk up and down a stage and get on <laughs> drum and stuff. so 
So, so it kind of dictated what I could and couldn't do. So let's just <laughs> say I erred on the side of um, being um, lightweight. <laughs> so, but I did partake in everything. I, and so, and, and, you know, I, you know, I love to have my wine. So, you know, and, uh, you know, I do all the normal things that, you know, a rock and roller would do, but to a lesser degree. So I think that's probably what helped me. I love that. Yeah. So you were around during those Laurel Canyon days of Crosby, Stills and Nash and all of that stuff. You were married to Cass Elliott's sister. You were a child together, Nathaniel, who Grammy and Emmy winner, your son. Yeah. 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 He is. Wow. That's, yeah. that has to be kind of thrilling. And he's this, he's one of the smartest people I know. I love Very that. proud of him. Yeah. I as love I am of Elsie as well. You know, they're both wonderful kids and Owen as well. So, wow, amazing. So, okay, so how did it come that you played with James Taylor? You played with Carol King, you played with Linda Ronstadt, you played with Jackson. How did you not, you made the choice, obviously, to not anchor into one situation and you were, how did you manage to, to play with all of that? How is that even physically possible that you were in all those places? Well, here again, uh, uh, Peter Asher's the linchpin to that because um, he managed James and Linda Ronstadt during the same period of time. So, mm -hmm. you know, one of Peter's main things was to have the same band that played on the album do the tour. He, he preferred that, you know, for the artists. So, so he would book the tour so that he could have the right personnel on, on the James Taylor tour and on the Linda Ronstadt tour. So he, he facilitated a lot of a lot of the logistics that made it possible for me to be in multiple bands, you know, at pretty much at the same time. And then when we when we toured with Jackson, that would just fall in the cracks, you know, the running on empty tour. I forget what year we did that, but it was, you know, it 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 just happened to be at a time when nothing else was going on. And so, but there was probably a Linda Ronstadt tour right after that. But it all, it all worked out. I mean, I, I'm, I've been blessed, very fortunate to, to have been able to play all that music with all those people in that, in that really compact period of time. Do, do you have a preference? Uh, you've done so much studio work and then you've done so much live work. Uh, do you love them equally? Is, is, is there a place where you feel most in your zone? Um, the recording process is very fulfilling because, um, you know, you get to see, get to see the uh, progression of, of, of a song being developed and, and, and be part of it. And then when you finally hear it finished, it's very rewarding. Okay. Um, so it's got, it's got a, a beginning, a middle and an end. And t touring is basically the joy of playing in front of people. At the, that you watch enjoy the music that you're playing. And my role has always been supportive, so I never had the anxiety that the, that the, the principal artist would have. I got to just kind of sit back behind the drums and really enjoy the ride, so. Does I, it feel I like differently? The, I, I like Does them it, both equally. Yeah. I'm, I interrupted you, I'm so I do that. I'm the interrupting okay. person. Do, do you, is, so that, is that anxiety is it still that way now with the immediate fit? Because now it's you guys. Now you're the guys. So has it changed? Not anxiety, but it has it changed the. I don't know. Is it different? Yeah, there's a lot more on the line. We're not. We're you know we're we're not on payroll, so to speak. You know we have to go out there. We have to make all this happen. You know. Right. And so there's requirements for that. We have to be rehearsed, we have to be prepared, you know, and, uh, and be smart, you know, about what we're doing now. So there is, there is definitely some anxiety involved in it, you know. But it's really nice when, we're, when we finish a show and it's been very successful, you know. We're, we're, on a, we're on a roll right now. It feels really good, oh. you know. By the way, the only reason I was not at the Canyon Club is because I am still COVID crazy and I haven't gone into a thing yet. I'm... I'm, I'm I'm still eating outside and doing that. But, well, um, I'm, I'm here to tell you on December 19th, the Canyon Club in Santa Clarita. You can come see us there. 
I hope I, I'm actually having hip replacement on December 3rd. So maybe I can hobble and I, you know, I just want to feel safe and I just want to be in a crowd and not be freaking out about it. Because we'll I'm a special place where you can have your wheelchair, all and, we'll, and we'll, 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 your own special viewing room. I love that. I love that. So, okay, I have to go back before we, we get more into things moving forward. I have to talk about Jimi Hendrix because I read that you were friends with him. Okay, so how did you meet Jimmy and what was that friendship like? Okay, well, here's a long story about that. Um, I did an interview at some point in Japan mm -hmm. and uh, love doing all kinds of work in Japan, but sometimes when an interview that's done in Japan gets translated into English or vice versa, uh, there's something gets lost in translation. Ah. I was not friends with Jimi Hendrix, nor was I in the band. So there's stuff in Wikipedia that's not true about me. Uh, and, no, uh, really? Yeah. Is that where it is? Yeah, and and like I, I, I my band opened for Jimi Hendrix at the Whiskey okay. Logo, and so I saw him there. But uh, and I was really I became really good friends with Levon in 1974 when the band were on a tour with Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young. And I was playing with Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young at the time. Right. So Levon and I got to be good friends, but I wasn't a member of the band. But the but music from Big Pink was a huge influence on my on me musically. So somehow all of that stuff got rolled up into I was in the band and played on music from Big Pink, and I was best friends with Jimi Hendrix. And that would, be true. <laughs> would I love? Would I have loved them to be true? Absolutely. But so we just have to set the record straight on that. Oh, we can. Set and Wikipedia is such a weird thing because all the information in there is is really put in by whoever wants to add information. It, you know, I've heard that. Is that true? And it's and you can, you can't go in and have your people go in and clean that up? No, no, no. I can go in and I have. I've gone in and changed things and then uh, then the, the next, go back and look at it again. It's all back the way that it used to be. <laughs> so it's it's really crazy. So yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, but I one thought person Jimi Hendrix was a huge influence on me. Loved his music. I did get to be good friends with Mitch Mitchell though. Well, we okay. hung out quite a bit, so you also got to play with someone who I also idolize on one of my favorite albums of his on, on Dylan's New Morning, which. So my friend Kenny Aronson was on a few weeks ago and he played with Bob later in the 80s. This was you were in the 70s. Um, what was your experience with Dylan like? No, oh, it's incredible. Uh, you know, I don't know. <laughs> uh, he's was, just... was he a hero of yours? Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Um, I was just pinching myself the whole time that I got to work with him. The, the way I got to play on New Morning is that, once again, I was in New York with Peter Asher. We had just finished, he was producing an artist named Tony Kosinak. We had finished the recording and I was back, I was at the hotel watching TV and Peter calls me and he said, put your drums in a cab and get down to, to CBS Studios right now. And I said, well, what's going on? Are we going to cut some more tracks? He goes, no, you're going to play with Bob Dylan and George Harrison. They need a drummer. <laughs> so, the two of them together? Yeah, they, would they, uh, George and Bob were very good friends and kind of a real mutual admiration society. And uh, George was in town and Bob was in town and they wanted to, they wanted to jam. So holy shit. Yeah, what, what, what was that? Well, tell me about that. Oh my God. I just, I was there, uh, uh, Al Cooper was playing organ, uh, Charlie Daniels from the Charlie Daniels band was playing bass. Oh, a, guy, a guitar player named Ron Cornelius was playing guitar. And they just, we did Beatles songs and Dylan songs and Elvis Presley songs and Everly Brothers songs and just recorded for about seven hours. It was and what happened to all that, all those recordings? Some of that stuff is on a bootleg album. Wow. Uh, somewhere. And then um, Bob Johnson, Bob's producer, called me back about two months later, come back to New York and play on New Morning. Oh, what an unbelievable. Those are the kind of things like like that that experience playing playing on Sweet Baby James, playing on Tapestry and playing on Blue. Mm -hmm. Like if that's all that I ever did that would be enough, you know, I, I, I'm in, in playing on Dylan's album. It's kind of like, okay, you know, I've had my share. Somebody else take over. You so know? tell us a little bit about playing 
playing on blue and playing with Joni. What was, uh, how, how did that, was that through Peter as well? No, uh, it wasn't. Um, I, 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 I think it was Joan's decision to, and maybe it was, she was with James at the time. So, you know, James might've been singing my praises and, and somehow I was called to, to come in and, you know, and play some of the, I basically played percussion and a little bit of drums because the songs didn't require, you know, any kind of big beat. So, uh, you know, it was a wonderful experience working with her and Henry Louis, two just absolute giants. And it just so happens that that album, I played, I played on Blue and I also played on some on Ladies of the Canyon. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, again, I mean, just such a huge talent. And then Crosby, Stills and Nash through from the beginning on and then well, each of them separately. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, it, that started by playing with Steven. Steven hired me to be in his band after Manassas broke up. Mm -hmm. And then uh, right after that, in 1974, CSNY decided to get back together and Steven wanted me to be the drummer. And uh, it was Joe Lala, myself, Tim Drummond, and the four of them. And, uh, and then after that, I went on to work with, with David and Graham, uh, uh, David separately, Graham separately, Steven separately. So... Did you overlap with Jeff Pivar? I've known Jeff for years. No, but I, but I, but Jeff, Jeff was in the band. I was a, I produced a, an album for Graham called Songs for Survivors, and then we went out to tour that album. And I was the musical director for him on that album. And Jeff was in the band. Jeff's a great human being, great guitar player, super, super. Um, so before I get to how the section all met and started, I just want to pull out a few names that kind of stuck out on your, on your disc discography. Barbara Streisand, what, how the hell did you play with Barbara Streisand? What, what's that about there? Oh, uh, you know, I was just called to do a session, you know, I, I forget who the producer was at the time. And um, she wasn't on the session. She was, she was on the phone with, uh, <laughs> with the producer because we were just cutting the track. But you did a lot with Neil Diamond. And I did some with Neil Diamond, and Neil Diamond is phenomenal. I mean, he. I mean, if you just think of his body of work, the mm -hmm. amazing songs that he's written, and he was a fun, uh, personable, really, really wonderful guy. Absolutely loved working with him. And then that, then he would open his mouth, and that voice would <laughs> would appear. You know, it's just incredible. I went to see him about 10 years ago at, I think it was at Madison Square Garden. And um, I went with a cynical friend of mine and I, I was kind of cynical. And, you know, Neil Diamond's fans are insane. I mean, insane. They, yeah. they go nuts. They know every word to every song. They worship. The, so they're all standing and screaming and we're sitting there just watching what's going on. I mean, he works a room like he, a room. He worked Madison Square Garden like nobody's business. And he wasn't a spring chicken. That's a pretty amazing, that's a pretty amazing thing. Okay. So how did, um, how did you and Lee and Danny, how, how did the section start? I know Peter is at the core of it, but. Um, I have to say one more thing about Neil Diamond. Yeah, yeah, please. Move on to that. Neil Diamond has had the same band. This is the kind of guy he is for, I don't know how many years. Really? All of his band members have been on retainer. Wow. That speaks volumes of him. Wow. Like, in other words, the guys that he started with, he kept, he made sure they were taken care of. And I got to meet a lot of them, you know, doing recording with him. And, uh, and I just think that that's, that's, that says a lot about who Neil Diamond is, you know, the, and Bob Seger did the same thing, mm. you know, Bob Seger and the silver bullet band, he kept that band together through all those years, you know, wow. and shared everything with them. And it's just, I, I just, I think that's great, you know, when, when artists who can have anybody they want, they take care of the guys that were there with them in the beginning. That's I love that. It's a big deal. Anyway, the section. So, uh, yeah, we were on tour with James Taylor and uh, Buford Jones, who was our front of house mixer. <clears throat> we would jam sometimes after sound check or wh wh whether James was there or not or after he left. And we would just jam on some funk stuff, you know, just play some rhythm and blues things. And Buford recorded some of it one day. And then he came back and he gave wow. us the cassette and we listened to it. And it was Leland, Craig Durge, Danny and myself. And we went, wow, this is pretty good stuff, you know? And that was, that's how the section started. <clears throat> and we, you know, we, we went into a rehearsal studio and kind of put some songs together and, 
then played it for Peter Asher, and he said, okay, I'll manage you guys, and he got us a record deal with Warner Brothers, and, you know, we, we I think we made three records, you know. And so why did that, did you guys, when you were doing that, did you think, okay, we can do, let's do this? I'm sure you were doing a lot of other things while you were doing that. Um, <clears throat> it was a, it was a period of time when, um, you know, kind of fusion music was popular. <clears throat> one of the one of the great things we got to do in the section was we did a tour with the Mahavishnu Orchestra, a tour of Canada that was really quite spectacular to watch mm -hmm. those guys, Billy Cobman, John McLaughlin, you know, Jerry Goodman, Rick Laird, and Jan Hammer play every night. <clears throat> so uh, it was a, it was a it was. Fusion music was a big deal right then, so we were kind of caught a little bit of that wave. But like most things, it had a, it had a shelf life for our interest, you know. And everyone was doing lots of other things, and it just kind of it, it kind of had a life. And it, you know, we did three records: two for Warner Brothers and one for Capitol. And that it just there was a the right time to end it, and we ended it. So I assume it didn't feel like what it feels like now in the immediate family. No, totally different. That was just instrumental music. We, we, are, we play rock and roll now. Yeah. You know, there's songs, and we have three great singers in the band, and, and, uh, three, and it's an interesting configuration, three guitars, bass, and drums. So it's, it's more like the Buffalo Springfield. So, yeah, so, so when, did Wadi be, when did Wadi get introduced into your world? Well, Wadi actually, we, uh, at one point in the section, we, I think Danny asked Wadi if he wanted to come and join the band, and Wadi so famously says, when you guys start doing songs with, with lyrics and vocals, <laughs> I'll think about it. <laughs> <laughs> so. So when did you guys, for, so when did you first work, because you guys have worked together through the years, when, when did you first work with Wadi? As, uh, you mean in the studio and stuff like yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. Wadi just told that story today. I think uh, I, we were hired by Lou Adler to play on a, uh, uh, what's, the, what's the star from, uh, his name's Curry. Um, he's an actor. Tim, Tim Curry. Tim Curry. It's a Tim Curry record. And Danny was on it and Leland and myself and Wadi. And that was really the first time that we played together. And then we started doing sessions together for different artists, whether it was Linda or Stevie Nicks or whoever, you know, just through all the years. It was just kind of natural, you know. And so, all right, so going back to James and Jackson and, and there was Carly. And so I, I'm, I'm not going to harp on your personal life too much, but I did see a little interview she did where she was asked if... Um, she was going to marry you. And I guess at the time you were engaged and she said, yes, a heavenly union, whatever. And then he said, well, how, how is James with that? And she said, well, ask James. And he said, well, how are James and Russ with each other? And she said, well, ask James and Russ. How, how did you guys survive all of that and come out on the other side, still being friends all these years later and making so much music together over the years? Was it ever stressful? Was that ever a challenge? Uh, uh, it was survived by being a grown up. <laughs> Wow. Oh, that's, you know, that's pretty much all I got to say about it. Okay. You know? I mean, situations like that obviously can be stressful, but, you know, um, there was a much bigger picture there and it was, it was being friends and, and music. So. And you continue, I, you played with Carly many years later and absolutely. I assume that you're still friends and all Abs that. Absolutely. Stuff. We don't, we don't speak very often. You mm -hmm. know, we kind of live in two separate, you know, worlds, but but I have the utmost respect for her as an artist and as a person, and she she's, was very kind. And the same with James, you know. It's a, a lot of a lot of miles traveled with James Taylor, and I love him to bits. So that was that was a very high profile little romance you had going on there. I, I mean, I remember the pictures and all the tabloids. You you seem like such a private person. Was that? you were really up front and center then was that was that uncomfortable for you or did you not pay attention to it uh 50 didn't pay attention and 50 percent uncomfortable <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah a lot of paparazzi um the pictures still exist today and then nicolette larson and, and having uh that uh another high profile um but one that sustained and and a marriage and and um 
I just, I have to say it because if I don't, everyone's gonna go, you didn't ask him about. So um, how did you meet? How did you meet Nicolette? How did that romance start? Oh God. Uh, well, I was always a fan of, mm -hmm. of Nicolette's, you know, um, I think the first time that I heard a lot of love, I went, wow, that's a really interesting voice. And then um, I was working, I think the first time I actually met her, I was working at a studio called The Complex and uh, Little Feet were rehearsing um, in a, 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 an annex room from one of the studios. And I went over there to listen to them rehearse and, and, and Nicolette was very close with all the guys in Little Feet. You know, she sang with them from time to time and, and, so, and so she was there. And you know, that's the first time that I actually really met her. Hmm. And then I, I met her a couple of times subsequent from that um, on a couple of Linda Ronstadt gigs because she was very good friends with Linda. So, and let's cool. talk about Linda. I mean, wow. Talk about another iconic artist that you did so much work with through the years. Um, how did Peter, did he instigate that as well? Yes, He's of course. Peter's, Peter's hand is in everything, you know. Uh, Linda Ron's that is just one of the all time great voices, you know, that there yeah. ever will be way before there was auto tune or any kind of pitch correction, you know, she's, She's, uh, you know, at the pinnacle of vocal prowess, you know, and getting to work with her and be on stage with her was a complete joy. You know? I can only imagine. How about, um, how about working with Carol? Same thing. I mean, you know. You've I mean, like played with every iconic woman that there is. Well, oh you know, God. Carol, Carol is just such a powerhouse in, in all levels. I mean, she's, She's a, an amazing songwriter. Her body of work by herself and with Jerry Goffin is just, you know, volumes and volumes of, of the songs that make up our lives, right? Mm -hmm. And she's a great piano player and a wonderful arranger and, you know, just, she's terrific. And a good friend, a really good friend. I saw you played on one of Louise's albums as well. Louise played My Living Room a few years ago and uh, Chip Off the Old Block, huh? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and Danny and I and Leland were just at the uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame with Carol. We, we, yes. We, we, we played You Got a Friend with her there for that. And I, I don't know when that's going to air, but- I can't cool. wait to see when that airs. I'm excited yeah. for that. I noticed that. Real that's real honored fabulous. to be asked by her to come. She could have done it by herself, but she wanted us to be there. As Carol says, I wanted the cats with me. <laughs> so. I love that. Um, so, and B.B. King, you you did a lot with B.B. King. Uh, well, uh, Carol and I played on an album of his called Indianola Mississippi Seeds. Yeah, it was great. Carol was just hired to be the piano player. <laughs> wow. Wonderful times. B.B. King hires Carol King to play piano on his album. And she was, she went absolutely. She was just so excited to be able to be, come and do a session and just play piano. She wow. was in heaven. Speaking of women who are hired to, ju to, to just play, like Bonnie just had a birthday the other day. And for me, I think she's one of the greatest like guitar players that has ever, ever been. Absolutely. Um, so you, you've played with these iconic women who are not only great singer songwriters, but they're also brilliant music, brilliant musicians. Um, how, how about Lyle Lovett? You've done a lot with Lyle in more recent times. How did you connect with Lyle? Well, I've actually worked with Lyle more than I've worked with any other artist that I've ever worked with. No, you know, no kidding. It's been, it's been like almost 16 years now, wow. you know, since I've been playing with him. I started playing and recording with him um, on Joshua Judge's Ruth. And prior to that, the first time I worked with him was on a, um, a, a Grateful Dead a tribute album. And I played on the song, um, what, what's the name? Um, not Sympathy for the Devil, Friend of the Devil. Friend of the Devil, is yeah, the yeah, first, yeah, yeah. That's the first song that I ever recorded with Lyle. Wow. Lyle is a wonderful human being and very loyal. And, uh, you know, my son, Nathaniel, uh, has engineered almost all of it and mixed almost all of his albums uh, since Joshua Judges Ruth. Wow. And so, uh, you know, Lyle and his whole family are just very, I'm very close with them. And really, really great being part of his uh, musical career. Brilliant, brilliant. No one like him. So unique. Absolutely. 
he, his music touches so many genres, you know, so. So unique in appearance as well. Nobody looks like Lyle on the planet no, either. No, not at all. <laughs> and he's, uh, and he's, again, he's an, another one of the smartest people I know. He's, in, he's an incredible intellect mm, and nice. great wit. That makes sense. I can see that. How, how did you connect with Mike Nichols to get involved in Heartburn? That's like a little career diversion there. Well, that was all Carly. You know, Carly and Mike have been friends for years, you know, so uh, he, he, Mike hired her to do the music for the, for the film. And, and Carly and I were together at that time, and she asked me, uh, George Massenberg, and Billy Payne to produce the music for her. It was great to be in the studio with Mike Nichols. I can't even imagine. Yeah. yeah. Is that something you'd like to do more of? Or is that, does that not hold a lot of interest for you? You know, I, I did a few film scores. Um, mm -hmm. that, that, that wasn't a score, but, it, but I've worked on a few films. It's a lot of work. And uh, I'm, glad that I, I'm glad that I did it. Wadi has actually done quite a few film scores. He's done a lot of Adam Sandler movies, so. Mm -hmm. Um, and Steve Postel has also done some. Um, I don't. I don't care to do any more of that. I'm. I'm fine with just playing in the immediate family right now. That's. That, that's that's a, that's a lot. So speaking of the immediate family, so I I go back with Steve thirty five years from Booking. I know that. Right. Yeah. So now how how did you guys bring? I mean I I know that Steve and Danny were doing things together. Is is how did. How was the decision made when you guys sat down and said, okay, we're going to do this band and we want to bring, how did that happen that Steve became part of the immediate Pretty family? much through Danny. Danny and Steve really had a, a relationship. Um, Steve was a big part of helping Danny integrate back into the LA scene when Danny moved back here from Connecticut. And mm -hmm. so um, that was important. And then we all got together to work on Danny's album that we did for the Japanese label, uh, Vivid. And it just started, we, you know, it's, it seemed great having three guitar players and another great, and, a, and a, Steve is a great vocalist. Oh my God. I was Nick. listening to somebody's baby a, a few hours ago. His, yeah. his vocal on that is just perfection. Yeah. And so uh, it was just a natural fit. I, I call him our most valuable player <laughs> because he does so much. He has a studio. He does so much of the technical work. He and Wadi both have studios. So mm -hmm. a lot of our, our work gets done in their two studios. So, you know, Steve's a huge talent. We're lucky to have him. How did that actual decision get made at this exact point in time for you guys to reconvene and to start up? And, and where did the name The Immediate Family come from? Danny came up with the name. And I, I, can't, I can't pinpoint a moment in time when we went, okay, we're doing this. It, I think it was when Danny asked us to do the, to, the tour of Japan to promote his album. Mm -hmm. And while we were over there playing, we would, I, we would just look at each other after a show and go, or at the bar in, back at the hotel and go, we should probably do this, you know? And everybody just said, yeah. The biggest decision was for Danny to decide that, you know, he, he did, didn't want to be a solo artist anymore and he wanted to be in a band. Mm -hmm. and, it, and, and he regret every once in a while he regrets it because he, you know, you know a band is, uh, you know, it's, it's a democracy. <laughs> uh, and when you're a solo artist, you get to make all the decisions. So I think there's been a couple moments when he's gone, fuck, why did I want to, why did I decide to be in a band? Now I, have to, now I have to do what everybody else wants. So anyway, but I think overall, I think he's quite happy, so. Um, it, it certainly looks like he's having a lot of, looks like you're all having a lot of fun. So wh what would be the dream? I'm going to, I'm going to honor this. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to finish under the wire. Wh what is the, what would be the highest dream that would happen for the, are you still going to go out and, and do the tours? I mean, I know you were on the tour um, with James and Carol, like, are you still going to do all of that stuff? What happens well, now? In a, in a perfect world. Mm -hmm. yeah. I haven't really thought about it, but I'll do my best to answer it. Uh, in a perfect world, um, the documentary will come out that Denny Tedesco is doing, and right. that it, that it will be noticed, and uh, and it will it will have uh, an impact, and that we would be able to uh, we would be able to to tour on a on a not not a grueling six month tour, but tour in a way that we could. Uh, go out and play music for people and not have us cost us anything other than just our time. 
<laughs> so I and mean, it's like it's like I said before, you know, when you you know when you're a baby band, you work for free for quite a while until you earn enough money per show to support yourself and your lifestyle by playing music. So we're kind of you know we're kind of in we got one foot in both of those ponds. So uh, that would be it for the documentary to do well and our music to be accepted and. And, uh, you know, for us to be able to go out and, and tour and play in front of people, you know. And, and, is, and, and be the immediate family and not, do, do, could you see yourself not doing Lyle, not doing all that other stuff? I can't say right now. It all, it all depends. I, I, you know, at this point in time for me, mm -hmm. I would prefer to do one thing, yeah. you know, and then, and then have the rest of the time to just spend with my family, you know. You know, it's like, you know, if you if you take, Vicky, if you take a tape measure and you put your finger at the age you are now and then and then you look up to about 85, which is what life expectancy is, and you see how much time you have left, you, ha you know, you have to make the decision about what you do with your time between now and then. And, uh, you know, I've been so fortunate in my life to have done a lot of great stuff. A lot of traveling, a lot of touring, a lot of music. I, I don't have to necessarily keep doing that. You know, mm -hmm. I'd, I'd rather spend the, spend the, the, a lot of the time with my family and and my friends. And that's why the immediate family works is because it's it's with my best friends, and my best mates, and and we get to do this at this late date. We get to still do it. So that's a real gift. I I can only imagine how close you and Lee must be having created all that music together and uh, you look like your great friends. I love you both. Um, is, is, is it heaven to, to play with Lee? I mean, you two together? It's, it's, it's so good. It's scary. <laughs> it's, it, it really is like, like we don't even think about what we're doing. It just happens, you know? And then people come and say, Oh my God, the way you guys play together. It's like, do you, do you talk about what you're going to do? No. We never talk about it. It just. Can you anticipate each other? Do you anticipate totally. each other? Yeah. He, he plays me and I play him. <laughs> you know? and, it, it, and it really is just like putting on a comfortable pair of loafers is mm. what it's like, you know, so. Like, you, that's like another marriage for you in your life, right? Kind oh, of. totally. Totally. But the great thing is that, you know, we don't live together. <laughs> yeah, that's probably all for the better. Russ, thank you so, so much for doing this. I've. I've been trying to get you in, in, in the studio for a long time, and I'm so grateful that you took the time because I know how busy you are. And I am so excited uh, to, uh, for those of you who are out there, there's immediate family music to be had, a documentary called The Immediate Family that will be out, Denny said, is soonish. <laughs> and uh, I know it's all, all the filming's been done and everything. So, uh, so that's wonderful. And okay, so tell us shows that are upcoming where people can, can catch you guys live. Uh, I, I don't have the list in front of me, but we start, in, uh, we start in Connecticut. We have six shows to do on the East Coast. We end up in Philadelphia. But uh, December 19th, we'll be at the Canyon Club in uh, Santa Clarita. So. Fantastic. Well, have a wonderful, happy Thanksgiving and holiday season. And I, I hope I get in there on the 19th. I, I can't wait to see you guys live. I just adore all of you. Vicki, you're very kind. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much, Russ. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.